Kenny, so uh, good to see you. Uh, the only announcement that we have is uh, next week we'll have the Lord's Supper, so we'll share in that next week. But at this time, I'd like to call our church family into uh, business. We have one item of business to take care of, and that is to elect uh, five trustees. We already have four that are willing to serve. Uh, the ones that were serving on the uh, transition committee. <clears throat> Susan Medley, Sylvia Martin, Mike Joyce, and Kenneth Myers. And they're willing to serve as the trustees for one assignment, and that is to sign the uh, incorporation documents when they get those ready. And Susan will get the minutes of the, this business meeting typed up, and I'll send it off tomorrow. And, and so uh, hopefully it won't be long that we can sit down and, and do that. But we need one more trustees to make up five, because there were originally five in 19, June of 1980 that signed the uh, documents to begin with, so uh, the attorneys asked us to elect five. So we need one more. And uh, if you will, if you'd like to uh, nominate someone from the floor at this time, would anyone like to nominate someone? Yes, Mary. I'd like to nominate Hank Thomas. Hank Thomas, okay. Anyone else want to be nominated? Are you willing to be nominated, uh, Hank? Yes, it's just a technicality, I think. Now, I'm not coming in like I know something. <laughs> 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 
Okay, okay, that's all you have to do. You don't have to answer any questions or not go through any inter interrogation or anything. It's just sign the document. I do know, I need to know how to write. Huh? I need to know how to write. Well, I, I guess you do by now. <laughs> okay, okay, so uh, all those in favor of electing uh, Hank as the fifth trustee, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, like sign. Okay, Hank, thank you. Now, if you will, uh, all those, do we need to make this a motion? Would someone, would someone make a motion that we elect, uh, that we nominate and vote on Susan Medley, Sylvia Martin, Mike George, Kenneth Myers, and Hank Thomas as the trustees? I make a motion. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. And Hank seconds it. All in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed by like sign. Okay, we have the five trustees. Now, let us vote on the five trustees to be elected. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, let it be known by, by saying aye. Aye. And all those opposed by like sign. Okay, so the motion carries. Thank you, uh, folks, for being willing to serve as trustees, and I'll get in touch with you when we find out our next step. Thank you very much. I know this has been a long process, and we've waited and not known exactly what was happening, but they're taking care of things and trying to get things moved along behind the scenes, but this was a very important step that had to be taken care of as soon as possible, and, uh, and then things will move along uh, more quickly. Okay. Let us uh, bow together as we go to the Lord in prayer and begin our time of worship. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your house of prayer. And we thank you, dear Lord, for each of your children that are here to worship. We just pray that you will draw us close together and close to you. And we pray your will will be done as we lift up Jesus Christ, your Son, and our Lord and Savior. And may we enjoy uh, praising you and worshiping you, Father. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Okay. Mary, if you'll come and lead us in our first team. Got the name of the song. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Let's stand and sing the first and fourth verse of this Great, great song. <laughs> sick folks or those who need our prayer. Kathy Shutt had dental surgery this week and she said it went well and uh, so she's uh, 
at home recuperating, so please pray for her. Uh, Mary Nell is doing uh, well and continuing uh, to take her antibiotics, and she'll be clear of that uh, soon, we hope. Daddy Edwards is uh, feeling a little weak, uh, having a little trouble walking, but he's in good spirits and, and doing well and continuing to uh, do what he needs to do to get better. So pray for he and May. Uh, pray for my mom, June Hester. She is not doing well. Uh, she's uh, not really excited about the food or the exercise that she has to do uh, to get better. But uh, pray for her as she uh, adjusts to this new transition of being uh, there at Brookridge. Pray for Kathy Honeycutt. She's a member of my home church, Union Cross, who has been suffering with pancreatic cancer for uh, about six or seven months, I think, and is not doing well. So pray for her and her husband, Randy, if you will, please. Okay, is there anyone on your mind or heart that you'd like for us to mention this, like for me to mention this morning? Anyone? Dennis? Yes, ma'am. We have a third grader in our school named uh, Edwards that has leukemia. <coughs> She has the same leukemia that Chad Tucker of uh, Fox 8 News, daughter Roro -Ro has, well, had. And she's just not responding to treatment. What's her first name? Emma. Emma? I'm talking about sending her to Levine uh, in Charlotte or another hospital. I can't remember. So just keep them and the family in your prayers. And she's in a third grader? Yes. Okay. So sad to see children have to suffer. Uh, with these diseases and the whole family, so be praying for him. Anyone else? Thank you, Susan. Anyone else? Okay. Would you join me as I lead in prayer, please? Father, we call on you often to, to look after us, to help us, to lead us, to guide us, to heal us. Forgive us for not coming to you enough to praise your holy name and to be excited about being your children. But we know that you care for us and you know our hearts and you know what we need and you know our loved ones that we love that cause us uh, a lot of challenges, Lord, and even trying to help them. But we pray, dear God, that you will work through us to be ministers, to be servants, to be helpers and to bring as much comfort as we possibly can to those who are struggling. We thank you for those who have returned to our church and feeling better, uh, Susan after COVID and Shirley and um, being able to come back today. We miss our church people and we pray for them and pray that you'll woo those who have gone astray or, or for other reasons have not returned. We pray that you will bring them back if they are willing to come back, Lord. We pray you'll give us all the will to serve you, the will to follow you, no matter what is going on in our lives. We pray for Kathy Shutt and Mary Ellen and Dave Edwards and June Hester and Kathy Honeycutt and Emma Edwards. They're having a tough time, Lord. We pray that you will bless all of them and heal them, strengthen them, give them courage and give them hope. And we know, dear God, that you do love us and will never forsake us or leave us. And we thank you, dear God, as we go through these dark valleys, our loved ones, and we who have to walk with them, we pray, dear God, that you will give us strength and hope. Pray for our country, Lord, that it will be shaken up by the Holy Spirit and that you will touch us and guide us and convict us and encourage us to turn to you and to live in a holy way. Because the only hope we have as Christians is living for you. So may our living and our praise and just our very joy of being a Christian will affect other people that we meet. And will be an opportunity to maybe lead them to Christ or at least a time of planting seed that will take place, dear God, and change our lives as well as others. Thank you for this time to worship. Bless us as we preach and as we listen. 
And as we all obey your will, in Christ in I pray. Amen. Okay, if you have your Bibles with you, you'd like to turn to them. I'll be reading from the Gospel of John, the ninth chapter, once again, as we continue this story about the man that was born blind and was healed by Jesus. Uh, my message today is, there's none so blind as those who will refuse to see. So look in John 9, beginning with verse 6 through 16. John 9, 6 through 16. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with his saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sin. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Therefore the neighbors, those who previously had seen that he was blind, said, Is not this, is not this he who sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. He said, I am he. Some were saying, Is this the man? Well, he looks sort of like him. No, he's, he just looks like somebody else looks like him. But the blind man stand over to the side and said, It's me. It's me. <laughs> Therefore they said to him in verse 10, How were your eyes opened? And he answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So he went and washed, and I received sight. Then they said to him, Where is he? He said, I don't know. They brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Now it was the Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees who asked him again how he had received his sight, he said to them, very matter-of-factly, he put clay on my eyes, I washed, and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. May God add his blessings to the reading, the hearing, and the obeying of his word. The second song is one that I'm not sure if the choir did it a lot or if the congregation sang it, so I'm assuming that y'all know it. And if you don't, it's time that you learned it. It is a contemporary song. It says here that the, the man who wrote this, the words and the music for this song was born in 1920. Now, I don't think any of us in here are, are quite that far back, but some of us are pushing it real hard. Um, <laughs> So that's, this, this is our music, so stand up please and we're going to sing two verses of Share His Love. Thank you, Mary. 
You may remember Ray Stevens singing Everything is Beautiful. There's one line in the song that goes, There's none so blind as he who will not see. It reminds me of the Pharisees who interrogated this man that Jesus had healed of his blindness. The theme of John is found in John 20, 30, 31. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in his book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That's the only person, uh, purpose of the Gospel of John is to reveal that Jesus is the Son of God, to proclaim the Gospel that we might believe in him and have eternal life. That is its purpose. But there are plenty like the Pharisees that didn't believe in Jesus, that didn't believe the gospel. This is remarkable, this remarkable story of healing a man born blind. From birth, he had never seen a butterfly, never seen a, a sunrise or a sunset. He had never seen the face of his parents, never seen the face of those who walked by him and dropped a few coins in his basket or a cup as he was begging to make a living. John wrote that this man's eyes were opened in a very unusual way. Look at verse 7. And he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sin. So he went and washed and came back seeing. In the, in the ninth chapter of the Gospel of John here, there's 41 verses. Two verses, just two verses, deal with his healing of being made where he can see. But most of the other verses are filled with confusion, cowardly lying, heated anger, critical questioning, stubborn disbelief, and eventually an act of violence where the Pharisees throw this man out of the synagogue because they did not agree with him or like what he was saying. The truth is, this blind man is not the only person that was blind in this story. Being blind is a horrible thing, but it's a spiritual blindness that is such a tragedy that can send people to eternal damnation. May God give us the light today and show us our own spiritual blindness that we might not be that we may be enlightened by his word and able to live more like Christ and shine the light of Jesus Christ that lives in us to the rest of the world. This man that met Jesus on the road was not only blind, he was a beggar. Because in verse 8 it says, Therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is not this he who said and begged? He couldn't help being blind because he was blind from birth. Uh, there wasn't an accident that caused him to be blind because it says he's blind from, from birth. And in verses 10 and 12, it says, Therefore they said to him, How were your eyes open? He said, and he answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received sight. Then they said to him, Where is he? And he said, I do not know where he is. The man was blind spiritually. He was innocent, helpless to do anything about his spiritual blindness until he met Jesus. And then all of that changed. He was given an opportunity to be healed of his physical blindness, therefore which made a way for him to be healed of his spiritual blindness. He, he obeyed Jesus in the very beginning when he put mud on his eyes and told him to go wash. He obeyed Jesus, but he did not believe him. But later on, he did come to believe who Jesus was. He was acting by blind faith in the beginning, but he was acting by his will and his spiritual faith at the end. You know, we do not have to know everything about Jesus to know him. Many people, they have an excuse, I, oh, I don't, I'm not a Christian, I can't understand that Bible, it's too archaic and uh, it's hard to read, and I don't understand it, understand anything about the Christian 
life or the Bible or all those stories and so forth. And they give a lot of excuses. But we don't have to know all of that. We don't even have to know all of that to share God's love and the love of Jesus with other people. As Vance Havner says, I don't understand electricity, but I'm not going to stand around in the dark until I do. And we don't have to understand all of the Bible to know its truths, to know its promises, and to be directed by our Lord. But after a person is introduced to Jesus and educated about who he is, what he is, what he died for, and our sins and our requirement to, to become a Christian, they are no longer innocent. Then they must get. Then they must make a decision. That's why it's so important for us to invite, simply invite, or bring someone to church, because we don't know the seeds that have already been planted in their life that God has already watered and had someone else to water it and give the increase that he might give increase and bring them to, to salvation. So it's very important that we get them to church if we, even, if, even if we don't have an opportunity to witness to them. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. A man, this man met Jesus and had a traumatic experience of healing. And Jesus shares the gospel with him later on after he's been interrogated by the family and by his uh, and the parents uh, don't reckon, uh, uh, don't support him. And the Pharisees two or three times they give him, take him through questioning. Finally, throw him out of the church. Jesus finds him and look what he says to him in verse thirty-five and following. And Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he found him, he said to him, "Do you believe in the Son of God?" He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have to both see him, and it you have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. It must have been a glorious moment when he first one of the first the first person he sees it, it seems was Jesus after he was made after he was healed and regained his sight. And here the first relationship that he forms is with Jesus Christ. People need what this man was beginning to find in Jesus, a relationship with him, walking with him, obeying him, and becoming his disciples. Today, people are more biblically illiterate than ever before. You would think not, since we have so many Bibles, bookstores, magazines, radio, TV, the internet, the Bible on the line, countless ways that people can read the Bible. But people, we have a generation that we'll be witnessing to now that don't know the Bible because their parents don't know. Many of their parents don't know the Bible. And they weren't brought up around the family altar praying and reading the scripture. And that's why it's so difficult to get an audience with them that this old book really, really matters and has answers that they need in their life today. It's just as progressive today as it was the day it was written and just as relevant. So it's hard to get them to understand and read. And that's why it's so important to build a relationship with them, to get an audience with them. Once we build a relationship, become friends, then we have more of an opportunity to plant the seed to share the gospel. According to the American Bible Society, about 9 out of 10 households, 87% of the people in America own a Bible. And some of them own as many as three. But they're missing a relationship with Jesus, even if their house is full of Bibles. Jesus' disciples were blind also to the truth at times. We'll visit verse 2 like we did last week. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? The disciples thought they had everything all figured out about this man. That he was either a sinner or he was a follower of Jesus Christ. And he had this sin, this sin in his life that had caused him to be cursed by God and cursed him with blindness. 
Well, of course they were all wrong. And Jesus told them that neither one of them had sinned, neither he nor his parents that caused his blindness. But they were way off from what this man really needed. The, the disciples could have been feeling a little bit prideful, don't you think? A little bit arrogant, a little bit self-righteous because they were walking with Jesus Christ and hearing his teaching, and here this man was blind, and pro he had most certainly been cursed of God with blindness because of his sin. But they were blind to the truth also, as well as this young man who was blind to the truth. But what the man needed more than anything, Jesus gave him. His mercy, his grace, his love, and his healing, instead of criticism and judgment. Now the neighbors who brought this man to the Pharisees and the, man, and the man's cowardly parents were blind also. They were blind with fear. Verses 8 through 13, the neighbors questioned the man and took him to the Pharisees. They were not just interested in what the Pharisees were saying, but they had a reason. In verse 16, they brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. They were afraid not to. They knew with all this commotion that the Pharisees would probably find out. And if they were there questioning him and talking to him, that they may be siding with him, which the Pharisees would be against. So they brought him to the Pharisees just to really be in good with the Pharisees and it not be any blowback on them for talking to this guy and getting to know him. You see, the Pharisees had such man-made laws they had frightened everyone. They had intimidated everyone. They made it a policy to throw people out of the synagogue if they associated or even spoke of the name of Jesus. Look in verse 34. They answered and said to him, You were completely born in your sins, and are you teaching us? And they cast him out. This young man was so brave. He was certainly a disciple even before he was a disciple. And he had asked them, do you want to be his disciples too? Because they kept badgering him about this man who had healed him and given him his sight. And he really gave them a fit talking with them and they were so angry about it that they cast him out of the synagogue. It, it was horrible consequences for the Pharisees to throw anybody out of the church, out of the synagogue. They were shunned by the community. There is no social status. And there's financial hardship on people who are thrown out of the synagogue because they could never return. There was different stages of uh, throwing them out of the synagogue, putting them out. You see, the parents were blind with fear because they feared the Pharisees, as many of the common people did, who were looking for a way. The Pharisees were looking for a way to discredit the miracle being performed by Jesus. And they called in his parents after discussing this issue with the neighbors. Look in verses 18 through 23. But the Jews did not believe concerning him. They did not believe the boy, the young man, was really blind. They thought it may have been a setup, that he was just kidding them, and that Jesus had really not healed him at all. That he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. And they asked him, saying, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age, ask him. He will speak for himself. They were scared to death that they were going to be thrown out of the synagogue also. So they didn't take up for their son. He's old enough. Let him speak for himself. Ask him. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already if anyone confessed that he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, 
ask him. The man couldn't get any support. Not even from his parents. He was begging, so we don't know if the parents helped him financially or not. He had to beg for a living. But they sure didn't stand up for the son as he was being questioned. The parents knew. The parents probably knew that Jesus had healed their son. Don't you think they had to after the son was healed? There, there was a lot of commotion because only God could heal someone from their blindness. So there was a lot of commotion in the community. People were sharing. People were passing along the word. And no doubt someone ran and told the parents. The parents were afraid and they knew that the son had been healed by Jesus, but they didn't want to admit that. Sometimes we fear, the fear makes cowards of us all. And we're afraid to witness about what they will say, what they will do, how they will act, and how it may hurt us. Pharisees were blind also. They worshipped their religion more than they did God. They were spiritually blind to God's truth. The real commu uh, community feared the Jews because they, they knew that the Pharisees could cast them out of the synagogue and make life very hard on them. There's many Americans today that live in fear of what our country is going through. I mean, we have now that where the FBI and other people can come to your house and razz you and question you and intimidate you about what do you know about politics, what do you think about the riot in D.C. on January the 6th and so forth. So some people are afraid to talk. They're afraid to talk openly about politics and speak against our president and the, and the uh, uh, leadership in, in, in D.C. at this time. They're afraid to mention Jesus at work or, or in school, on the job somewhere, or even among their friends because they don't want to be singled out, made fun of, or hurt in any way. And there's an element of people in our church, I mean in our country, that would like to, of course they can't throw people out of our church, but they would like to close the church. They would like to silence the preachers from the pulpit, the radio, TV, or internet, or anywhere else. And some, it may come to the place that they'll even start censoring what ministers say because they think, because if it hinges on uh hate speech or something against the, the government or against politics or against a certain race or a certain type of people with a certain lifestyle, then they will be able to reprimand us in some way. So how we need to pray for the church, how we need to pray for ministers and church leaders and, and congregations that we will stand strong and speak the truth regardless of what they say and what will happen in the future that we might stand with Christ and be the light and be a witness. Here was the problem, verse 14. Now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. That was the big problem here. It wasn't about the boy being healed. It wasn't about that at all. It was about the Sabbath. Because Jesus had spit in the dirt and then he got the dirt and the saliva and he rubbed it together and made a little mud pie to put on this man's eyes. And the Pharisees considered him making that little mud pie work. So he had broken their holy Sabbath. And the Sabbath is holy. The time we come to worship is holy. But it's not something that we live our lives by. And the Pharisees had made it the most important thing, it seemed, in their life. Because Jesus now was working, he was guilty of breaking the Sabbath. And it was just another excuse, another trap, another trick, another way to get at Jesus and to remove him from the community. The Pharisees had hundreds of rules. They couldn't look in a mirror fixed to the wall without breaking the Sabbath. They couldn't light a candle because it was breaking the Sabbath. Now they could pay a Gentile to light the candle, 
and it wouldn't be breaking the Sabbath. They couldn't rub wheat together and blow in it and blow the shaft, the husk of the wheat away so they could take the wheat and make bread because that would be working, even if they were hungry. They couldn't sew a button on a piece of clothing. And get this, if a hen was, was an egg-laying hen, then it was not okay to eat an egg laid on the Sabbath because the hen was working. So the rules not only affected people, it affected animals also. If the hen was just being fattened up to be eaten, she could lay an egg. And then that was not working, so she was free. Now you tell me how they were going to inform, uh, uh, inform this. How were they going to find out who was eating what kind of egg? Were they going to go around to East Chicken Lock and chicken a lot and watch the egg, hens lay an egg and see who ate the right kind of egg from the right kind of hen. You say, well, that's crazy. Well, back not too many years ago, you remember when the new progressive music was coming into the church. And a lot of churches split over the music that was coming into the church because some people they were doing away with everything in the church and just having a praise band and a head singing on the wall they called it they had the screens they had the the uh, praise bands they had contemporary music and they just did away with the old and some churches became so angry and divided over it it split their churches i heard of the pentecostals once allowed only a certain brand of piano in their church. They didn't want those honky-tonk pianos. They wanted the more sophisticated and, and dignified and anointed pianos in their church. Had to be a certain brand before you could bring it and play it in the church. The fundamentals, the fundamental Baptists. Remember they used to preach and maybe still do against long hair and short dresses and smoking and dancing. So we too can become Pharisaic, Pharisaic if we will allow it in our own life and church. We can be blind also. Here's why the miracle is so important. Jesus was fulfilling his calling as the Messiah. He was taking action and healing this man of his blindness because he had a need, regardless of when it was on the Sabbath or not. And at the same time, he was preparing this man to be healed spiritually. In the prophet Isaiah, this will shed some light on why the Pharisees uh, were so against Jesus. Isaiah 42, 6 through 8. Isaiah the prophet says, I the Lord have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. I am the Lord that is my name and my glory. I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. That was in the prophet Isaiah. He said that the Messiah would come to heal and to set the prisoners free. And then the miracle here in John is fulfilled of that prof uh, prophetic, messianic statement that prophet Isaiah has made in chapter 42. The Jews knew that this, they knew the passage in Isaiah. They had also heard what John the Baptist had asked. No doubt when John the Baptist was in prison, and he's about to get his head cut off. And he says to the disciples, <laughs> you get a little shaky in, in, uh, in prison getting ready for your head to be cut off. And he just wanted to know, go ask Jesus, is he the one? Is he the one that I should have been preaching about? Is he the one that was really supposed to come? Is he the Messiah? Because I'm about ready to lose my head and I just want to know if I was doing the right thing. That's what, it, in essence, he was asking his disciples. And the disciples go to Jesus and they ask him what Jesus was saying. A asked him uh, that in Luke, 
Luke 7, excuse me. Luke 7, 21 and 22. And that very hour he cured many of infirmities and afflictions and evil spirits, and to many blind he gave sight. So Jesus was performing these miracles when the disciples of John were coming to him to ask him the question. And Jesus answered and said to them, John's disciples, Go and tell John the things you have seen and heard that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. No wonder the Jews were so threatened by Jesus. Spiritually, because they were so spiritually, spiritually blind to who Jesus was, the Son of God, the Messiah. They already, believed, they already had their own system of belief. They already had things worked out. I remember trying to witness to a Jewish boy when I was in college. And he said to me, he says, I don't need to be saved. I'm already saved. Because he was a Jewish of belief. The Jews would say, we have been called of God. We are God's people. We are descendants of Abraham. We've been delivered from Egypt, given <clears throat> the promised land and the temple where we can go and sacrifice the animals on, and, uh, and God will forgive us of our sins. But they had a place of power and wealth and position in their, in their uh, Jewish leadership in the uh, temple because the people had to pay temple tax. They had to buy lambs so they could be sacrificed. So they had a lot to lose. And they didn't like the gospel that Jesus was preaching. You see, they were in control of the people and of society. And it angered them for Jesus was not the type of Messiah. He was not the type of Savior that they really were looking for. He was not a warrior. He was a gentle, loving, kind man that would stop for a beggar on the side of the road and heal him of his blindness. They became so angry over all of this miracle stuff and over this boy, this man that had been, that Jesus healed and they just couldn't get the right information from him because they wanted to use his blindness and his miracle to trick Jesus and to, find, and to show what a uh, sinner he was in working on the Sabbath. Look in verse 28 and 29. <clears throat> then they reveled him or reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. We don't go along with all this gospel stuff that Jesus is teaching in this new way he is teaching about about uh, the gospel and God's love and forgiveness and healing and so forth. Only God can forgive sin. And then in verse 29, we know that God spoke to Moses as for his fellow, but for this fellow we do not know where he is from. We do not know where he is from. They reviled him. They got in his face. They jumped all over him. They yelled at him, insulted him, made fun of him, spoke abusively to him, and they were lying. No doubt that the Pharisees knew that it was Jesus who had healed this man also because no man could come and heal another man except the Son of God. Only God could heal the blind. And they hadn't heard at this time in Jesus' ministry, he was very popular. He had already peaked in popularity and was headed toward the cross. And they knew him. They had heard many stories about him. They had fought him all of their life to get rid of him. The Jews had tried to brainwash the people toward Jesus by telling them how bad and sinful and demon-possessed, what he was a, such a heretic and an insane religious nut, and he was to be feared and, and stayed away from. That's what they heard from the, from the religious community about Jesus. And here they're trying to discredit this miracle of healing because it was now obvious that this poor man had actually been healed. 
even on the Sabbath, he had been healed. And it was sending a shiver down through these people's theology because it was shaking them up and making them even more threatened that Jesus may be who he really said he was. They were trying to use this good fortune of this man that had been healed as a way to exploit and trap Jesus so they could eventually get rid of him and kill him. And they eventually did. The man was blind. The disciples were blind. The neighbors were blind. The parents were blind. The Pharisees were blind. And today, people are still blind and they hate Christians. Many of them do. They hate the church. They hate the Bible. They hate the Word because the Bible, if they read it, sheds light on who they are and what they need to do. It reveals to them that they are sinners. The gospel reveals to them that they are sinners. Jesus Christ in His Word and preaching in the church calls people out to make a decision for Jesus Christ. It calls them out of their blindness and into the light so they will change. But the problem is they don't want to change. Men love darkness more than light. They love to live in their sin. That's why they don't want to change. Because men and women are sinners. They love sin and love to control their own lives and hide in the darkness of unbelief. Do you know anyone who is living in darkness that you might make friends with, that you might pray for, that you might lead them to know the light of Jesus Christ before it's too late? Does the spiritual light of Jesus and His witness that shines in us, we don't have to be afraid. And may we let our light shine in thanks of God and for what He's done for us that He has set us free and delivered us from our bondage of sin and darkness. And Jesus has called us not to put our light under a bushel, not to hide it, to be openly and honest with our light of Jesus Christ who lives in us and that we might share the light of the gospel with them. I challenge all of us to recommit ourselves to be bold in this dark time in our country, in our communities, that we might be the light, that we might shine His gospel message wherever we go. As Gar Darlene comes to play our invitational hymn, may we recommit ourselves to that. And if there's any other decision that God's laid on your heart that you want to pray about where you are, or come allow me to pray with you, or at, at the altar here, at the set on the front pew, wherever you feel comfortable, then you come and she plays.
as you think about some of these people that are not here today, then pray for them. Get your church directory and go down and, and pray for them. Uh, that they might be encouraged. Uh, anyone else got something to say before we go? Maybe that. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your presence. Thank you for the light that you've brought us out of the darkness that we might enjoy for eternity. Now bless us and use us for your sake and your glory. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen.